All right, so I will be talking to you about social engineering. So first, let's get a few things out of the way. What is it? Well, imagine you have a castle to protect some sort of data. Hacking in the traditional sense would be going around, poking the walls to see which brick is loosest, or where to add an extra brick so the whole wall crumbles. Meanwhile, social engineering is just simply walking up to the front gate and tricking the guy operating it to open up. And this is why social engineering is so dangerous. I mean, you can build thicker walls or you can dig a deeper moat, but the human element can still be compromised. Also, the castle analogy still holds true in the literal sense, as social engineering is very often used in the physical world to gain access to secure locations. Now, first I will go over the current social engineering tactics, and here in this list I've loosely organized them from tactics that are exclusive to the digital world to those that are exclusively physical. So let's start with the first tactic, phishing. Or as I like to call it, the Nigerian Prince one. So phishing is very much a shotgun approach, meaning that fire as many shots as possible and well, one of them has to hit the target. And because of this, phishing has very low success rates. Around 3% of all phishing attacks are successful. And but because it can target such a wide range uh, of people, it is by far the most popular online scam method. I mean, I'm sure everyone here has received some sort of spam email at some point asking to reset their eBay password or something along those lines. Also, because it's so broad, it kind of requires a bit of naivety to fall for a phishing attack. Uh, that's why the overwhelming majority of people who lose money to phishing attacks are seniors above 60 years old. Um, additionally, um, as just said, phishing is mainly used to exploit financial data. And although a 3% success rate doesn't sound like much, since phishing targets so many people, 3% of a large number is still a lot of damage. For example, $91 million were lost last year in Australia alone, according to the Australian Center for Commerce and <coughs> two other C's I can't remember. Now. On to spear phishing. Uh, spear phishing and phishing are principally the same, with one key difference, being that spear phishing is far more targeted than regular phishing. Therefore, it also requires some extra research by the attacker. For example, where the targets work, their gender, their age, etc. And because of that, they are far more effective than regular phishing emails. Uh, spear phishing emails are 25 times more likely to be open than regular phishing ones. And because of this, they can also be used for uh, a larger variety of purposes, because instead of targeting a large group of people with the standard, dear PayPal customer, please reset your password, it can be tailored to some or maybe even all employees of a specific company to disclose their network credentials. Additionally, both spear phishing and phishing attacks are almost exclusively administered over email. This is uh, firstly because the style of emails of large companies can very easily be replicated. Additionally, they can be sent to a mass of people with little to no cost almost instantly. And finally, there are tools out there that very easily exploit flaws in the email system. For example, there are online services right now that yet let you send an email from any fake email address to any real one. Now, on to quid pro quo, which means something for something in Latin. And Quid pro quo is a method of essentially finding the easiest point of entry into a system. For example, if an attacker were to call a company's employees offering tech support, I'm sure a lot of the employees will turn him down, but eventually one who actually needs tech support will gladly talk to them and likely disclose their network credentials. But it doesn't necessarily require active involvement by the attacker. For example, they could set up a, a website that tests the security of your password and all you have to do is enter it. Or one I've seen is a website that checks if your credit card details have been stolen and all you have to do is enter your credit card number and security pin and it'll do the rest. And essentially quid pro quo is bribing the target or offering a service in exchange um, for information by the target. Now onto the next weirdly water related one, water holing. So, Waterholing is a way of exploiting targets' trusts. 
um, especially, uh, specifically the trust in services or websites they commonly use. Um, for example, early infections of the WannaCry ransomware were administered through a combination of both waterhole and phishing attacks. And um, it also targets a specific group of people who use a website or service. Uh, CCleaner, for example, which is a popular PC space ring tool, was exploited for as over a month last year, the official CCleaner download contained malware. And why this is so powerful, because if the same malware were on some random email or link on the internet, the user would likely be far more wary of clicking it. Meanwhile, if it's on a trusted, whoops, trusted source, um, such as a software they commonly use or an update therefore, they're far more, li far more likely to fall for it. Um, however, the one key downside of waterholing that it actually requires website exports to function. Um, attackers usually use uh, zero day exploits, such as once again, WannaCry, uh, use the eternal blue exploit in older Windows operating systems to function. And because of that, waterholing somewhat blurs the line between hacking and social engineering. But due to this element of trust, um, waterholing can be very effective. Uh, for example, in 2014, Chinese attackers used exploits in Flash um, to infect users of Forbes.com, which ultimately led them to gain access to US defense systems. Now, on to pretexting. Pretexting is quite simply pretending someone you're not or in a situation you aren't. And it can come in many different forms, for example, being contacted by an authorized Microsoft IT helper to divulge access to your personal computer, or from your system administrator to do the same. Um, additionally, since an individual, uh, it, it, pretexting relies, can also rely on an individual's trust of authority. And since humans are taught to respect authority, this can be very powerful. For example, a group of Australians decided to put this to the test a while ago, simply by buying high visibility vests and seeing what kind of places they could get into which ultimately ended up with them getting into an Australian Coldplay concert, not only for free, but also standing literally next to the stage. Now, finally, on to baiting. Baiting is essentially a physical Trojan horse, and usually comes in the form of leaving physical traps, such as a USB stick, lying around, labeled in an interesting manner, of course, with some sort of malware on it. And this very much relies on human curiosity, Curiosity, because I'm sure a lot of us, if they were to see a USB stick on the floor labeled confidential or top secret, would probably plug it into their computer just to see what's on it. And um, because of this, in 2016, researchers dropped almost 300 USB drives around the campus of the University of Illinois uh, with a simple script on it that phoned home once it was plugged into a computer. And ultimately, 45% of the deployed USB sticks were inserted and thus detectable by the researchers. So now that we've looked at the current tactics, let, let's look at what's to come. Or specifically, the ability of future social engineers to perfectly impersonate anyone they wish, granting them immense capabilities. So first, let's talk about the first aspect, imperfect impersonation speech. And specifically, let's look at Adobe Project Voco. Project Voco allows the modification of a clip of spoken audio. Specifically, it uses simple text-to-speech to allow visual uh, editing of the spoken, spoken text. And because of this, it was aptly dubbed by Adobe themselves the Photoshop of voice. And however, it has some limitations. Firstly, it operates exclusively inside that clip of audio, meaning that it is quite easy to rearrange words and maybe replace one or two or add a few. However, it doesn't really have the capability to add extra phrases or even do this live. Therefore, for an impersonation standpoint, it isn't really viable. However, there are still enough nefarious applications for this that Adobe actually never released Voco to the public. Let's elevate this one level though and look at Liarbird. Liarbird is an AI startup that uses a five-minute recording of someone's speech, uh, combined with neural network speech analysis to create a model of someone's speaking patterns, allowing for full speech synthesis. 
And contrary to Voco, this allows for full flexibility, i.e. you could have someone read a book in, you could read a book in someone's voice. Uh, however, because of this, it also requires more effort and material than Voco. Since Voco only requires one clip of audio, Lyrebird requires at least five minutes of recording to produce a halfway decent result. But also, Lyrebird can be live, so translate your voice into someone else's on the fly. And so, let's look at an example of this. Um, first, let's listen to a recording of the actual Donald Trump, and then let's listen to the fully AI speech synthesized version. We call on every nation, including China and Russia, to fully implement UN Security Council resolutions, downgrade diplomatic relations with the regime, and sever all ties of trade and technology. So, that was the actual Donald Trump, and now let's look at the AI version. The United States is considering, in addition to other options, stopping all trade with any country doing business with North Korea. Although there, it isn't quite perfect, and I mean, there are still some telltale signs, such as the weird metallic garbling in the background sometimes, it's pretty good, especially considering some of the enunciation and speech patterns that are clearly traceable back to Trump. And so, as this tech develops, this voice will become more and more convincing, and maybe even at some point indistinguishable from the actual person. So, now that we've got the speech part covered, let's look at the visual aspects of impersonation. Firstly, let's look at Fake App. Fake App, similar to Lyrebird, is an AI-powered um, application, but instead of doing voice synthesis, it does face swapping. Uh, additionally, it is very time intensive as it takes long rendering and uh, it has long rendering and learning times to produce an adequate result. Additionally, uh, hours of footage have to be used of both the subject and the target to produce a convincing result. Um, however, once you meet those requirements, it produces excellent outcomes. And since the software is free and has been easily compiled with a graphic user interface, the internet has had its fun with it. Specifically, they put Nick Cage in anything they could find, <laughs> such as in this clip uploaded by a Reddit user uh, from the new Superman movie. <laughs> and as you can see, the result is near perfect. I mean, it looks almost like a real Amy Adams, Nick Cage mashup thing. And... Um, However, fake app has been used for some slightly less fun and less water-related purposes, mainly blackmail. Um, criminals have been putting people's faces in situations they weren't in, mostly, usually erotic, um, and then wanted money for not releasing the video. As a result of this, all fake app outputs are now watermarked, but also since fake app isn't live, it doesn't really offer much from an impersonation standpoint. So let's look at something more applicable, that being face-to-face. Face-to-face <laughs> is also AI-based, but instead of doing face swapping, it simply swaps facial expression, meaning that it takes an RGB video of a source actor um, and analyzes their facial expression and then plays that onto a simple video of the target actor. So let's look, an example of, let's look at an example that's working. Oops. There we go. Um, so, contrary to FaceApp, um, Face it's relatively inexpensive because while FaceApp needs, um, Face needs a relatively powerful computer and lots of time, this only requires a webcam and an RGB video of the target. Um, additionally, it is live. As you can see, the source actor's facial expression is being mapped onto the target actor's video in real time. Yet face-to-face -face is also somewhat limited, being that it, is, it operates exclusively in the video clip of the target actor, seeing as only facial expressions are being mapped. For example, if the source actor were to move his head, for example, that would not translate onto the real-time reenactment. But let's look at one last solution that could solve all these problems, that being Unreal Engine. So, uh, a few weeks ago, Epic Games, the maker of Unreal Engine, put out a tech demo of what they called a digital human, showing near-photorealistic results 
uh, in real time, in real time rendering of an actress in a motion capture suit in the um, room next door, and it looks something like this. And as you can see, the result is still a bit in the uncanny valley, but seeing that this is rendered live, it is an incredibly um, impressive result. However, <laughs> there are also some drawbacks of this method. Firstly, it requires very expensive tracking equipment, as the actress, the source actress for this, was actually rigged up like this. Um, additionally, it requires very powerful computers to run on, as remember, this is all done in real time. Um, however, computer power is getting cheaper year over year. And additionally, Unreal Engine offers full flexibility of lighting, environment, clothing, and most importantly, the person being displayed. Yet this comes with one drawback, being that it would require a 3D model of the target. Yet imagine a default character model with a few tweakable features, such as in present uh, in most video games today, with, such as is present in most video games with a character creator today, coupled with a few pictures of the target's face, can most likely create a very convincing look, especially imagine if it's over a Skype connection, for example. And now back to the tracking aspect. That is the most um, expensive part of this whole setup. However, cheaper technology exists right now and I'm holding it in my hand. So this Taiwanese visual effects artist actually demonstrates this, um, demonstrates the tracking capabilities of the iPhone X by mapping his facial expressions onto a 3D mesh. And while some may argue this isn't practically viable yet for the fidelity used in the Unreal Engine example, um, some game developers, such as Next Games, are actually already using this exact technology to animate digital characters in their games. So, as you can see here, all their setup is, is an iPhone X and a custom-built app to animate 3D characters in real time using the facial tracking of the phone. So, this of course begs the question, would a future version of an AI synthesis coupled with a rendering engine allow you to impersonate anyone? Well, at the moment, it's not really viable for anyone to do this. However, in the future, with a handful of newer developments, this could become very possible for anyone to do. So imagine in the near future, getting a Skype call from someone who talks like your boss and looks like your boss or anyone else imaginable. Why wouldn't you believe what they say? Now, this of course raises a simple question. How can I protect myself? Well, um, this question doesn't have a simple answer, and not only because the technology isn't fully developed yet, but there are a few steps that don't only apply to future social en engineering, but also current. Firstly, common sense and critical thinking. This definitely isn't a miss in any setting, but especially important in the internet, on the internet and in a social engineering standpoint. So just ask, is this email from eBay really valid or is this completely random and just trying to get my information? Uh, thirdly, a two-factor confirmation system for everything would, not, uh, would go a long ways, i.e. confirming every order you get and just making sure it's correct. And additionally, there might be another option, being that you don't have to protect yourself. Because technology advances in all directions, so if there's an AI system faking someone's voice on the phone, there similarly might be one detecting it. So, in conclusion, social engineering will only become more prevalent as digital systems become more and more secure. And as the common mantra goes, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And this certainly applies to all digital systems. And increasingly, the human element is the weakest link. And with emerging technologies such as the previously mentioned AI voice synthesis, this human element will come under attack more and more, making digital awareness as important as ever. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very entertaining and very interesting. Uh, any questions? Yes. Um, thank you for a great presentation. It's really exciting. So I should like to add a personal story. So sure. you showed the picture of the concert and the vest. And mm -hmm. in the early 1980s, I was at the 
uh, you need to help with the emergency service. As a volunteer and a friend of mine asked me, well, let's take the orange ticket and our um, card and then um, go to the Rolling Stones. And we were just, we entered and then um, there was a border um, for, for the area which was not for the public and there were some policemen and we, we did not want to cross that border but the policeman asked us well we can help you and so <laughs> we, we did it so it was not our intention so we just wanted to attend the um, concert and finally we ended up below the stage and we saw the people pushing against the borders and we just watched it and so um, it really works so as this yeah. was the story <laughs> that's incredible so, Okay, let me give you that. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, I find a really great talk. Thank you. So congratulations on that. And uh, about protection, mm -hmm. do we need to make and think about paraphrases? Huh? <laughs> For paraphrase, so when you talk with someone to check is that that person? Some like, private yeah, like talk? secret phrases or something. Yeah, something like that. I'm gonna repeat the question. Yeah, uh, so the question was, for a protection, would like a secret exchange phrase to validate the person's identity be a good way of protection? And sure, definitely. I mean, if you can um, um, construct such a system, that probably be a very good way of mustering out all the potential social engineers. And what do you think about uh, that people uh, let their biometrics online, so like uh, fingerprints or iris scan or whatever, and that is not protected, so you can push all of, two of them, and what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, the question was about biometrics on the web, and I think it's very possible. I think uh, if, when the iPhone 5S came out, a few researchers were actually able to, I think, get fingerprints off a photo, <laughs> and I think I make that mistake myself, because although I think it's really cool, my background is actually my fingerprint, so <laughs> that might not be too great. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's a possibility, especially with Face ID now on the newer iPhones. Uh, I, the, I'm sure the possibility exists to get an adequate 3D model of someone's face from a few pictures. We'll take that out before we distribute it. <laughs> <laughs> no? You can't use the finger anymore. Yeah, I use the face, it's fine. Okay. Yes, Jen. Um, when you were talking, you mentioned at the very solutions that there could be potentially so we have this AI that's do, that's creating the stuff maybe we have some sort of AI on the back end detecting the stuff have you looked at or have you seen anybody who's been introducing this kind of idea of some yeah sort of detection system? yeah um, the question was about AI um, specifically asking about the AI solutions I mentioned and I think there are already a few companies that employ um, AI for um, Cybersecurity. I think one's Dark Trace, and one was I can't remember the name. Was recently bought by Sophos, the antivirus software, and they employ that already. Yes. In, in the UK, um, telephone banking will be using voice detection for the rooms, um, and when you set up your telephone banking system, it automatically asks you to to record the voice of the room. It sounds like really That's very cool. Yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, a lot of banks are deploying a bunch of different techniques like that. Um, a couple of location services and uh, the voice use and all that kind of stuff. Cool. One, one more question. Yeah, uh, what do you think about uh, the idea that in the future maybe every kind of conversation could start with some kind of science badges? If you want to talk over the internet, I can send you a message, you will send it, and you will sign it by some signing algorithm. And this uh, signing could happen in a device connected ex externally through USB. And this device would be very down. It would be used only for signing and taking the broadcast. What do you think about it? Uh, yeah, the question was about, I think, like two-factor authentication, essentially, for uh, phone calls in the future. And I think, I'm sure it's a possibility, because especially if these technologies get used more frequently, I mean, the market will exist for uh, something that makes phone calls more secure, and especially over the internet. And so, I mean, this could already be valid outside of a social engineering standpoint. If, for example, government officials want to communicate securely, this could definitely be used to validate someone's identity. Yeah. Cool.
Thank you. Thank you so much.